Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. So today we're talking about an enhanced approach to the fatigue assessment of deck mounted equipment. So firstly, I'd just like to thank um, Osbit Limited, our local bespoke offshore equipment designers and manufacturers who kindly provided us with the opening video and allowed us to talk about some of the projects we've undertaken with them. So just very quickly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'll be your host today. My name is Michael Williams, I'm the Managing Director of PDL, and we're an advanced engineering consultancy based in Hexham. So I'm a chartered mechanical engineer by trade, and I'm going to go on in a second to introduce our speaker. But before I do that, I just want to cover a couple of bits of housekeeping, uh, just so you get the best experience from today's webinar. So hopefully what you'll be seeing is a, a dialog box uh, with various controls. You'll be able to access your audio and, and various aspects through that. If it disappears, you can actually um, uncheck the auto hide button and that will allow it to stay on the screen so you can access it to ask questions, etc. On that note, uh, in terms of the audio, hopefully you can hear me at this point. If, if you're just reading it on the screen, you can't get access then there are instructions here to dial in via the phone line as well. And if you do have any technical issues, you'll find in the panel there is a questions um, area where you can pop a question in and Kate or Linz will do their, their absolute best to, to help you with that problem. What we're also using that for is to pop questions in for David, which we'll address at the end. So just feel free to write any questions along the way. We'll collate those and we'll try and answer as many poss as possible at the end. So without any further ado, we'll go on to introduce the speaker for today. So we have David Udell, he's the chief engineer at PDL. He's a chartered mechanical engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. He's got 26 years of industry experience in stress analysis of critical components and structures predominantly in risk adverse industries and is considered a subject matter expert in fatigue assessment. So you're in very good hands today. David's going to be taking over for the next 30 to 40 minutes and thereafter we'll have a few minutes to address some of the submitted questions and wrap up the session. So over to David. Thank you Michael and uh, welcome to everybody. As Michael said, the objective of this webinar is to look at an approach to the fatigue assessment of deck mounted structures. And you'll notice that we've used the term enhanced in the title. Hopefully the reasons for that will become clear as we go through, but we'll, we'll touch on that again at the end. So um, a couple of overview slides. Um, in our experience, vessel equipment fatigue assessments are often squeezed in at the end of a project. There are many reasons for this, but essentially they all boil down to having the right level of data available. Um, and the kind of data we're talking about includes obviously the detailed geometry, the well details, the equipment deck positioning, vessel REO data, sea states for operation and time on condition data, for example. Um, and it's not usually till towards the end of the project that all that information comes together. It is possible to do fatigue assessments using preliminary data, but because partly because they're very sensitive to the stress and partly because they can be quite time consuming, um, there is a, a reluctance to conduct them earlier in the project. And so this kind of time constraint can often lead to oversimplification, resulting in one or both of uh, overweight design and therefore excessive cost, or the emission of load cases, potentially leading to structural concerns later on. So this presentation outlines our approach to conducting the fatigue assessments to the requirements of DNVGL RPC203, but with some enhancements applied. The approach uses finite element analysis and ANSYS macros to conduct an efficient ass assessment whilst minimizing undue conservatism. And this approach has been used to successfully gain certification from DNV GEL for a number of large projects. But this slide shows some of those large projects. Um, 
So on the left-hand side, you can see a cantilevered sliding deck with a capacity of about 150 tonnes. In the middle, you can see a multi-storey maintenance tower. And then on the right-hand side, you can see an, an intervention tension frame, which is the example we're going to use in the rest of this presentation. Um, but just to make the point that the, the methodology that we're talking about can be applied to any deck mounted equipment or even any equipment that's being carried on the on the deck so just a little bit about the in <coughs> intervention tension frame or itf as we'll call it from here on um, the itf is used to carry out well intervention operations from floating platforms it ensures that the riser is kept in tension whilst coil tubing and wireline operations are executed uh, Typical coil tubing operation might be a gas injection and a wireline operation might involve lowering an inspection device or a tool into the well. The ITF uh, operates suspended from a multi-purpose tower or MPT via a heave compensation system. The MPT itself uh, is used to assemble and dis disassemble BOP stacks um, and then the ITF can then be brought into position to, to carry out the, the other operations. Uh, the image in the center shows a, a, a long gray square column and that's representing the um, MPT. And then you can see the ITF in red. The heave compensation system enables personnel to work on the ITF structure during operations by minimizing the relative movement between the riser and the vessel. The ITF is also fitted with a set of skids for moving equipment, for example, injectors and lubricators into position. And when not in use, uh, the ITF is stowed elsewhere on the vessel. And as uh, Michael mentioned at the start, the ITFs that we're going to be looking at are designed and built by Osbit Limited. Okay, this slide shows um, a couple of the vessels where the ITFs are uh, installed. So there are ITFs on the CM Helix 1 and 2, um, which is shown on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a Q7000 semi-submersible. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the MPT highlighted, and you can see the ITF in its stowed position further back on the vessel. A couple of ITF parameters. It weighs roughly 110 tonnes, 19 metres high. And it can carry up to 500 tonnes. Okay, so this slide shows an outline of the process that we need to go through. So we begin by creating a finite element models um, using ANSYS in this case. We then run a, a set of unit load cases. Um, so the, the most important ones, those are the environmental ones uh, causing surge, sway, heave, roll, pitch and yaw. Uh, then we uh, extract the results from those stress analyses and input them into the APDL macro, APDL being the ANSYS design language, um, which uh, uh, has, there are many other inputs required for that, which we'll talk about later on. And once we've run the damage macro, then we can start to create some interesting color plots and graphs and complete the post-processing. So just to talk a little bit about the FE model setup, um, I'll just try and use a pointer here. Uh, so in the center of the image, you can see the ITF frame, uh, and this is shown in a configuration that it's used, that, that it takes up and whilst it's in transit. Um, so you can see some of the sea fastenings there. And the image at the top left here shows the sea fastening location in more detail. And this image at the bottom left shows the the, the bottom of the frame where you can uh, you can see the hole through which the coil tubing and wireline operations take place. And then on the right hand side, you can see the, the top of the frame. We've removed a front panel there so you can see some of the internal stiffening ribs uh, which support the frame close to where it's supported uh, at the crown through the through the bales. OK, uh, the mesh. Um, the, uh, the image on the left-hand side shows the, the shell model. Um, you can see it looks rather black, and that's because uh, 
all the elements are shown and all the elements have a black line around them and we're using quite a, a, a high definition mesh. Um, so uh, we've zoomed in at the bottom left hand side so you can see the bottom of the frame and you can see the kind of mesh density that we're applying. So overall the shell model consists of about 250,000 elements. And then we also create a set of solid sub-models, some examples of which you can see on the right hand side. Um, these could be anything from 250,000 elements to a million elements. Um, but the, the important thing is we, we need to create these um, in regions that are either particularly complicated um, or whether or in regions where we think it's important to include the weld bead or whether the structure is, is, is more like a, a plated fabrication rather than a box uh, where it's more important there to use solid models. Okay, so once we've uh, set up the model, um, we can begin to uh, look at the loading, which is what we're going to do on the next few slides. Uh, so this is where it can start to get a little bit involved. Um, the, um, the fatigue loads come from a variety of sources, um, but the most important one is the, uh, the vessel's response to incident waves. Um, and there are a large number of load cases relating to that environmental condition um, because we have to consider a large number of wave headings, periods and wave heights. And there are different loading scenarios for operation, transit and survival cases. Um, so what we, what we do is we begin with the unit load case setup. So we run unit load cases for heave, sway and surge. Uh, so these are the uh, linear accelerations and we just apply a nom nominal linear acceleration at this point, one meters per second squared. And then we create uh, three e equivalent rotational acceleration cases, uh, one radian per second squared for each of those. Uh, and we produce nodal stresses across across the full model for those cases. There's also one other case that we run, which can be described as a unit load case, which is uh, which looks at the the vertical loading um, variation as the as the wave passes. Um, all of the uh, points I'm going to mention briefly on this slide, um, we'll look at in more detail on subsequent slides. Uh, so, after we've um, developed the unit load cases, we need to uh, understand how the uh, vessel responds to the incoming waves, and that's done through the response amplitude operators, or RAOs. Uh, and we need to look at the amplitude and phase data for those. <clears throat> Once we have that information, we can start to calculate the stress range for each of the incoming waves that we want to consider. And we do that by breaking the stress tensor down into its six components. So we have SX, SY, and SZ, the linear direct terms, and then the three shear terms. And each of those is evaluated for each of the six degrees of freedom um, from the RAO inputs. Um, and we include the phase angle there, as, as I've mentioned. Once we've got each of those six terms uh, for the six degrees of freedom, we effectively have a matrix of 36 stress terms for each wave. And then we sum all the SXs, SYs, SZs, etc. And finally, we combine them together to generate a, a profile of the principal stress range and extract the maximum principal stress range. The number of load cases um, and the number of uh, cycles that we need to apply for each of the wave and period data pairs is established from scattered diagrams uh, and there are usually a number of those um, and th that number of cycles um, we're going to call little ni uh, which I'll explain in a second and so that's the input number of cycles the permitted or allowable number of cycles for each wave is established from the appropriate fatigue curve and that number of cycles is going to be called big NI. And once we have all that information we can calculate the damage for for each wave and um, so 
the uh, formula at the bottom kind of explains that. So D is the damage ratio. Um, little n, as I said, is the uh, number of incoming waves and big N is the uh, acceptable number of waves uh, for a particular condition. Um, so the damage is, is a simple ratio of, of those two numbers. And we calculate the damage for each uh, of the incoming waves and then we sum that damage together. And the idea is that uh, as long as the damage, the total damage is less than one, uh, then we're okay. In practice, um, we probably want to have a, a target damage less than one um, so that we include some safety factor, uh, sometimes described as a design fatigue factor in the code. Uh, so we might be designing for a damage ratio of 0.33 or 0.1, for example. Uh, so now we can look at some of these in a little bit more detail. I'm just going to take a sip of water here. Okay, so the response amplitude operators. So we usually uh, start with displacement operate uh, displacement RAOs, and these are usually supplied by the the vessel manufacturer. There'll usually be a set of different RAOs for different heel trim draft, uh, and whether the flume tanks are active or not. From those displacement RAOs, we calculate acceleration RAOs. Uh, and those need to be calculated in the frame of reference of the vessel. Um, so we need to take into account how the direction of gravity varies um, depending on the angle of the vessel uh, as we carry out those uh, acceleration REO calculations. And then we uh, incorporate the amplitude and phase information in order to uh, calculate accurate combined loading. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you can see a couple of examples I'm sure you're familiar with um, for operational role. Um, so this is one of the RAOs. So you can see we've got a wave period on the x-axis and a, a response value on the on the y-axis, and three different responses for three different headings there. And we've got the equivalent information for phase in this bottom left diagram. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, uh, we've got a chart that describes the response of the heap compensation system. So this is what we use to figure out the vertical load variation uh, uh, or what the ver vertical load variation is as a wave passes. Uh, so on the, uh, the x-axis, we've got uh, a block position kind of centered about zero, zero. And then uh, on the y-axis, we've got a load at the crown. Um, for most of the operational cycles, the system operates in a passive heave compensation mode, which is represented by this red line. So we can see by from the wave amplitude, as if we go between plus and minus one, for example, um, we can see what the, the load variation is. Uh, and that's another important parameter. Okay, the wave loading itself, um, is um, described by uh, the scatter diagram, um, one of which is shown at the, at the bottom of this chart. Uh, so this one's actually taken from the C205 code, um, and this is for worldwide trade. So you can see wave period going across the top um, and a significant wave height down the side. And each of the cells within this chart represents a C state uh, and a, a, a proportion of time that's spent at that C state. Uh, so we take that information as an input and then we, we break each cell down into more detailed information um, so that the significant wave height and TZ data pairs develop into a matrix of wave heights uh, typically based on a rally distribution and periods which are typically based on a normal distribution. Um, so, for example, for um, a significant wave height of one meter, there'll, there'll be a, a set of wave heights between zero and up, up to around about two meters. So once we've created or expanded each cell into a, a set of uh, wave height and period data pairs, we can then reconstruct the table so that it looks something like what we've got here. 
uh, except that it will be slightly expanded. Uh, so you can see the the periods here go up to 17 and a half seconds. Typically, the final table will go up to about 30 seconds, and the significant wave heights shown here up to 14 meters uh, will probably end up extending that to 20, 25 meters. And um, when we when we generate the reconstructed uh, chart, we need to ensure that the energy content uh, within what we've produced matches with what the input was. Um, so the, the the table will finish up with um, obviously different different numbers of occurrences uh, than we've got here in the input. Um, we'll be talking about bins, fatigue bins later on. Um, a bin is just um, a description of uh, a wave and period uh, data pair. Okay. So we've um, mentioned that we're, we're going to finish up with a large number of load cases and this uh, chart kind of explains how that arises. Uh, so we'll just go through these six blocks quickly. Um, so we've got a design environment here. In this case, we're looking at the Magnus field. Um, in practice, there could be a number of different design environments. Um, and then within, within that, we've got different vessel loading scenarios. We've got operational cases, transit cases, and survival cases. Each of those typically has two or three different uh, configurations uh, shown in the next block. And then for each configuration, we've got uh, different vessel headings to consider. Uh, so the operational cases typically operate uh, at head C or close to it. Uh, but obviously the transit cases, we need to cover every 15 degrees. Um, and then for each of those wave headings, we've got a C state or a set of C states to consider. Uh, so these are the HSTZ pairs that we looked at on the previous chart covering the, the wave loading. And then once we've got the C state information, then we break that down further as we've discussed into individual uh, data pairs for wave height and period. So once we've collated all that information, we're just about ready to run the APDL damage macro. Uh, and the macro calculates the fatigue damage for each node in the model using the unit load stresses, the REO amplitude and phase information, and the reconstructed wave scatter diagrams. And, and also the fatigue curves are built into it as well. Uh, the macros that we've created uh, use node vectors to speed up the processing. Um, so rather than looping through every node one by one, um, we're, we're just uh, using vectors, which, are, which makes it much quicker. Uh, and we overwrite some of the intermediate results as we go along in order to avoid creating um, huge data files, although that's less of an issue these days. Okay, so the macro works on the basis that the fatigue loading can be broken down into a, a number of discrete load bins. Um, and the, the sort of numbers we're talking about uh, will, will be exceeding 10,000, uh, it's usually in the tens of thousands. In this particular example, I think we actually finished up with just over 200,000, um, but we've, we've slimmed the methodology down a little bit, um, so we don't have to go quite that far. Um, the next few bullet points kind of just recap on, on what we've just been speaking about. Um, uh, sorry, just technical problem. Um, okay, here we are. The, um, so the wave environment is represented by the, the reconstructed scatter diagrams, which define the number of occurrences of each wave over the lifetime of the equipment. The unit acceleration load case information uh, tells us how a given acceleration causes stress in the structure. The vessel REO data provides information on how a given wave produces the six off acceleration vectors. We can then produce the res uh, resulting stress range from the individual stress terms. The allowable number of cycles comes from the, the chosen fatigue curve, which we'll speak about a little bit in a second. And uh, then we can calculate the fatigue damage for each loading bin and then sum up all the damage uh, using miner's rule 
Okay, just a, a little bit on the code. Uh, so we're working to the RPC203 code. Um, it does talk about a simplified method. It's in chapter five, which uses uh, a Weibull um, distribution to describe the uh, input loading. Um, but the Weibull distribution requires a shape and a scale factor, which are usually not available. Um, there are some rules of thumb and some data available for ships, um, but it's not really re intended to be used for deck mounted equipment. And the results are very sensitive. The fatigue results are very sensitive to the, the shape and the scale factor, particularly the shape factor. Uh, and you can produce by varying the shape factor a small amount, you can produce a very wide range of possible fatigue damage. Uh, so we, we've done some testing. We would generally not recommend using that as an approach. So what we're talking about using is the, the spectral or stochastic method, um, which is mentioned in chapter one, but it's more fully described in the classification note 30.7. So this is a much more involved method. Um, and it's, it's typically where uh, shortcuts can be applied or have been applied in the past um, to try and speed things up because of the time constraints that we discussed at the start. Um, so what we've done is try to avoid making shortcuts um, by including the effect of the phasing accurately. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're avoiding uh, assuming all of the REOs uh, respond at the same time or using some kind of square root of the sum of the squares type approach. Um, we've got an accurate calculation there. And then we calculate the individual stress components and combine those to generate a, a maximum principal stress range. And we've got a very well discretized uh, set of load cases um, for the different wave heights and periods. Uh, so we're not just using the kind of top of the bin parameters. We've got a very detailed distribution um, and it's particularly important for, for the wave height um, because the, the wave height um, or the stress that's produced is proportional to the wave height and the damage is proportional to the stress typically to the power three, four or five for the fatigue curves that we're using. So you only need a small, small error in your stress to get a big change in the damage. So it's very important to have a very uh, accurate distribution of your wave heights. Okay, so the fatigue curves that we're using come from the DNV code. Uh, the C203 code uh, is really for high cycle fatigue, uh, and the fatigue curves start at uh, 10,000 cycles. Um, so what we've done is we've extrapolated the fatigue curves back into the low cycle fatigue regime using the NORSOC N006 code, and that's done um, in order to more accurately capture um, sort of one-off events uh, that might be high stress events in, for example, a, a survival case uh, so that we can calculate the damage caused by that um, more accurately. Uh, so the, the chart you can see here at, uh, on the left-hand side is a combined fatigue curve chart. Uh, so we've got number of cycles to failure on the x-axis and stress range on the y-axis. Uh, and you can see that there's, um, I think, 15 different fatigue curves that are that are drawn on this chart. Um, the one at the bottom is, uh, is called the W3 curve, <clears throat> and this is kind of for a, a low quality weld. Um, but that is a useful chart to use, or a useful curve to use, um, because if um, if the structure can be shown to pass to that that curve, it means that we don't need to do any further assessment on on that part of the structure. Um, we also make quite a lot of use of the D curve, which is used for the hotspot method, and um, particularly for the uh, solid submodels. Um, but sometimes we can't use either of those curves, and we have to look at the individual geometry and uh, and or weld classification. Um, and there's a there's a whole list of different classifications in the code. Uh, one of which is shown on the right hand side. Uh, so this is just um, an unwelded plate loaded longitudinally. Um, and for that, you can use the C curve, for example. And as I mentioned before, these curves are built into the macro 
Okay, so I think that covers what the macro does. And so we're now at the point where we can start to produce some contour plots and graphs and uh, finish off the post-processing. So we've got a, a few uh, contour plots here. These plots are all showing damage. Uh, so we've got damage plotted across the full structure. Um, on a, on a scale from blue to red here, so red being high damage. Um, so the, the image on the left hand side uh, here shows the, uh, um, the shell model um, in, uh, in its uh, stowed configuration again. Um, and this has been assessed using the W3 curve. And you can see there are actually quite a, only a small number of regions that uh, are, are in the red region. Uh, so that means that there's large parts of the structure here that are uh, already shown to be acceptable. Um, so the great value of this chart really is to, is to identify immediately uh, or instantaneously almost what or where the critical regions on the structure are, and then we can concentrate on those in more detail. Um, so uh, the, um, the zoomed in image here in, in image A shows a, a region at the bottom of the frame where you can just about make out in these uh, little red boxes um, three regions where we do have a red contour band and those are looked at in, in more detail or oh, sorry the, this one on the left hand side is looked at in more detail in images B and C uh, so in image B just a, a zoomed in region um, showing the geometrical feature and um, again that's plotted using the W3 curve um, so once we've identified what the critical region is and what the critical geometry looks like and what the well detail is, we can select a more appropriate fatigue curve or a fatigue curve that's, that fits that particular scenario, which, we've, what, what, which is what we've done in image C. So and then we've recalculated the damage here, which can be done very quickly um, with a, a different fatigue curve. And we can see straight away that the, the realistic damage is, is much less than what we've assumed in the pessimistic case. Um, and we can do much the same kind of thing with the, the solid submodels. Uh, so the, the image on the left hand side here, image A, shows um, the, a solid submodel with the weld bead in included. Um, you can see we've effectively drawn a line uh, along the model at uh, half a plate thickness away from the toe of the weld and extracted the stresses at that point and calculated the, the damage um, or the damage that we extract is, is, is taken from that point. Uh, you can also use a slightly more involved method where the stresses are picked off at uh, also one and a half plate thicknesses away and then you can uh, extrapolate back to the weld toe. Um, and that's so that we avoid um, calculating an unrealistic damage level at the discontinuity in the model. Um, the plot on the right hand side um, is, is just shows another one of the submodels um, for a, a kind of a complicated feature. So one of the useful things or the other useful things that we can do with the macro is to understand where the damage is coming from. Uh, so on the left hand side you can see uh, the total damage um, in the middle we've got the damage caused by the operational loading and on the right hand side the damage caused in the stowed case uh, so what's quite interesting here is that we're actually seeing more damage from the stowed case than we are from the operational case um, and the, the reason behind that is is that the the ITF is designed for predominantly for vertical loading um, so it's it's an efficient structure from that point of view. Um, but when it's in its stowed location, it's obviously in the, it's in a different position on the vessel. Uh, there are heading, wave headings coming from different directions. And the sea fastenings um, potentially can vary from vessel to vessel. Um, and the load path through the structure changes because of those, uh, those different um, parameters and because it's not necessarily being designed for the stowed case in particular. Um, you, you can get a situation like this where the damage is enhanced. Another interesting way of um, showing the data is on a fatigue diagram. Um, so in this particular example, we had uh, over 200 
thousand data points. Um, and those are plotted on these diagrams that you can see here. So um, again, this is cycles on the x-axis and stress range on the y-axis. And uh, these have been plotted against a, a nominal fatigue curve. Um, so you can see um, we've got uh, three different operational phases shown in, in different colors. And we can look at the, uh, the particular data point um, and figure out what uh, loading has gone in to create that, that, um, that particular data point. And obviously the, the points that are closer to the fatigue line are, the, are those that are causing the highest damage. So very quickly, you can build up uh, an idea of which uh, load cases are driving the damage, which ones are the most important um, to, to think about um, if, if there needs to be any kind of redesign. Um, and a similar plot on the right hand side, this time for, for transit cases, showing the same kind of information. Another thing we can do is to plot the, the damage on a, on a wave scatter diagram, uh, which is what we've done on, in the top image here. Um, so we've got wave period across the top and significant wave height uh, coming down. Uh, and red represents high damage and blue low damage. Uh, so that, again, helps us to understand where the loading is coming from. So we can see which sea states are causing the most damage. Um, and this is for a single node uh, on the model. Um, and then we have the same data plotted underneath, uh, except that we're plotting numbers, numbers of cycles in this case. Um, so it, again, it shows where the high number of cycles are, um, but you can see that the high damage uh, it occurs at a different C state uh, than the high number of cycles. Um, and that, that's again, because of what we we're touching on before that um, it's, this, it's the stress level uh, that's particularly important um, and tends to override the, the cycle information to an, to an extent. But this provides, again, useful information um, in terms of looking at which are the important load cases. OK, so to sum up, um, we've used a finite element analysis to run a series of unit acceleration cases uh, and a vertical load case. We've used uh, RAO amplitude and phase data to give high accuracy. Um, we've got a large number of wave height uh, and period load bins to ensure uh, an accurate load distribution. Um, we've got a number of cycles for each of those load cases coming from the scatter diagrams. We've got an allowable fatigue cycles coming from uh, the input fatigue curve for the particular feature and then we've using we use the APDL macro to calculate fatigue damage for each bin we've post 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 processed using the DNVGL and NORSOC fatigue curve combination uh, and the detailed uh, geometry classifications from within the code so what all that's enabled us to do is to avoid having to make estimates for example of where the fatigue uh, critical fatigue locations are going to be or what the critical fatigue load cases are going to be, which are the, the kinds of things that we would have done in the past when we had less computing power. And then that uh, avoidance of oversimplification has enabled us to produce accurate results and avoid overly pessimistic uh, damage calculations. So why do we call the method enhanced? There's kind of three main reasons for this. Um, first one, accuracy and detail. Um, we're calculating damage for several million nodes. Um, and that damage is being calculated for typically several tens of thousands of different load cases. Uh, so if you multiply those two numbers together, you can see how much data that we're dealing with. Um, but that enables us, like I said before, to get an accurate result, avoid oversimplification and minimize conservatism. From an efficiency point of view, uh, it's, a, it's very helpful in identifying, uh, like we said before, the critical regions. Uh, so the most important regions of the geometry that we need to look at. Uh, and in terms of which load cases are causing the most damage. And we've got the macro now working uh, 
in such a way as to produce this kind of data very quickly. And finally, from a, a knowledge point of view, we've been undertaking this kind of work for a, a number of years now, and we've developed a, an in-depth knowledge of the C203 codes and methods, and we're able to give advice um, on where the um, uh, there might be modifications required, for example, and what practical modifications need to be. Uh, and we've got extensive experience of assisting clients through the DNV GL certification process. Okay, I'll uh, hand back to Michael. That's great. Thanks very much for that, David. Um, so we've got a, a load of questions have come in during the course of the webinar, um, and we'll, we'll do as many as we can. Uh, to give David a, a brief respite, uh, one of the questions that came in, I've managed to field uh, via Peter Ward, one of our senior engineers. The question that came in was actually regarding the mesh density on the solid submodels and whether we needed sort of three or, or more elements through thickness. And what Peter's just come back with is, um, it's, it's obviously it's a good rule of thumb, but it's, it's not always necessary in non-critical regions when we're using second order elements, um, which is what we did in all of the 3D submodels that were shown. Um, it do, you do get some guidance from um, RPC203 in that it actually states that only one second order element in solids needs to be placed through thickness. But if, however, you are using first order elements, then, then four are recommended. So it was a good spot from our audience member, but, um, but thankfully Peter had a good answer as well. So um, a couple of questions for David now. Um, the first one was just um, a question that's come in is, is asking about if there was a design change, and I guess this may be um, an actual change in a functional design, or it may be to do with dealing with a problem area, what sort of duration would it take to go back and make that design change and get a new set of results? Um, it, um, it depends on the level of design change, I guess. Um, if it's involving, for example, uh, just the shell model, um, and it's something that we can adjust by simply changing the thickness of the shell within the model, um, that can be run very quickly. The, the shell model will, will run overnight. Um, the macro, again, will run overnight. Um, so you could very quickly generate um, a new a new damage plot um, if that's the situation. Um, for more complicated changes, obviously it depends how long the, the geometry takes to modify as much as anything, um, and if we've got to generate a, an extra sub model. Um, but we're only really talking about an extra an extra day or two. Um, so um, even quite big design changes should be able to be assessed within three or four days. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty efficient process. It's, it's very yeah. efficient, yeah. Okay, good. Um, one question that's come through is regarding operational loads. So I guess what we're talking about here is predominantly environmentally driven, but if we wanted to sort of deal with operational loads as well, can that be accounted for? Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, yes, that's we're, we're our, um, uh, what we've been talking about today is really all coming from environmental cases um, but if there are operational uh, fatigue load variations of significance then that damage needs to be calculated as well um, and you do have to be careful with that it's um, you can't just calculate the damage separately and just add it that would be non-conservative at the same time we don't want to create stress ranges that are too conservative in a, whereby we assume that the peak operational stress range is occurring at exactly the same time as the peak um, we're, we're getting from the, the wave of product. Um, so we actually, we go back to the code for this kind of thing. There's a, there's a method in C203 which allows you to take uh, two sets of uh, different types of loading that are occurring at the same time, but are kind of unrelated and to calculate an, an appropriate overall damage from, from those two different sets of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. I guess one very, very quickly, it's kind of related, I guess. Um, if we did get sort of um, vessel accelerometer data, um, would we be able to sort of update to account for that or, or almost like do a live fatigue damage calculation? Um, yeah, that's uh, something that you could you could head towards if you had the, the right kind of input data. Mm -hmm. um, we could certainly modify the model or the macro to take into account um, 
accelerometer measurements taken directly from the vessel. You have to think about a little bit about exactly how to do that um, and where we would need to take data from. Um, but it's certainly amenable to um, taking data in and calculating the damage, kind of maybe not exactly live, but almost live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, good. Um, right, we're pretty much out of time now, so I'm going to leave the questions there. So apologies if we didn't get around to answering your question directly during the webinar, uh, but please be assured we will follow up with, with any questions we, we didn't manage to catch. Equally, if you think of something after the webinar and you've got a burning question for us, um, contact details have just popped up on the screen there. Please feel free to drop either David or myself an email, preferably David if it's a difficult question, over the coming days. Um, Last couple of bits of housekeeping from me uh, before we do a few thank yous is we will be continuing the Knowledge Library series um, with a, a number of different topics. So the next ones are likely to be threaded connectors. Um, we're also looking at pressure vessel analysis, particularly with high pressure, high temperature, and also process optimization and automation. So we'll, uh, we'll obviously reach out to you through the usual channels as the, the dates for those are confirmed in the coming months. Um, also, as a reminder, please look out for a link to a recording of this webinar, which should pop up in your inbox. And also, you will get a copy, a PDF copy, that is, of these slides. And please feel free to share those with your colleagues. So, so finally, um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank David for sharing his knowledge today, uh, to thank Kate and Linz from the PDL team for their work behind the scenes. And lastly, to thank you, the audience, for joining us here today. Thank you. <laughs>